as our new fundraiser. So this little booklet is designed to go in medical marijuana evaluation clinics and dispensaries, and it will be rented for your clinic or dispensary. And the idea is it can be given to new patients at either location. And this bridges the gap between butt tenders, who are not allowed to give medical advice, and doctors and clinics who are not allowed to have a relationship with the butt tender or dispensary. Mm -hmm. So it's general information on cannabis medicine. Um, it's been reviewed by a bunch of our different member physicians, and we are still taking input on that. But my son, who grudgingly, different son, who grudgingly did the layout for us, says, you can make text changes, but no layout changes. <laughs> so now you know. Uh, there is no, currently, there is no Word document for it because the text changed so radically between the initial draft in January and the way the layout went. So if you just red pen it for, it for me and give it back to me if you find problems or changes. Um, we have been using prototypes of these just printed. This is printed on my kitchen printer over a long period of time, all day long, only 25. Uh, but we have been using this prototype in clinic at Healthy Choices, and it has been wildly popular. Like, I cannot leave them out on the counter. And every time we give them to um, an extremely naive patient, they call, they come back, they're like, I want two of those now. I want to send one to my aunt in New York. I need one for my grandfather who's got cancer who won't even consider this. So, you know, hopefully they'll be just as popular for you as they are for us. But that is the goal behind this is number one, a fundraiser for us, and number two, so that we can actually give some information to butt tenders if you'll note that page 20 is the contraindications and cautions page. And this is designed also to help cover your butt. So if there's more butt covering that needs to be done, let me know and I will simply extend it off to the other page. <laughs> Thank you very much. You. Um, next up, I've got one more uh, weird little sample for everyone tonight. Is well, okay. First, we're going to talk about one more thing, and then I'll give everyone a little sample. So, for our RU impaired day, um, we are moving along just fine on that, and I have been preparing IRB documents for Biomed, which is an IRB that we put a call out to members uh, in January asking who wanted to be on their cannabis IRB to review things. And then one of our members said, Hey, why aren't we making money with our own IRB? And I talked to our lawyer, and he said that is well within our purview as a professional society to run our own cannabis IRB with our trained people. So that's what we're looking at now is actually forming our own IRB at Cannabis Clinicians Colorado that you could all be members of, whoever wants to, and then we will review outside cannabis studies and our own internal cannabis studies. Um, so anyone who's interested in being on the IRB, uh, shoot me an email um, because we are moving forward with our RU Impaired Day as our first thing. Now, personally, I have been on this Biomed IRB, but I have never run one myself. However, the person who suggested this ran the one at Rose for years, so he's happy to do the oversight on it. What I have, though, from being on the Biomed one is all of the forms and paperwork. And since no contract has ever been written twice in the history of mankind, we're simply going to be modifying those. And I will send them out to members who want to be on the IRB for review, and we'll move forward from there. Our impaired day is set right now for August 27th at the Lakewood Car Museum from 11 a.m. until 5 p.m. During that six-hour time frame, we estimate we should be able to, to run through 40 test subjects. So we want 20 medical patients and 20 recreational users. We are still working on the, um, uh, the inclusion and exclusion criteria. In general, you know, inclusion criteria is you're over the age of 18 if you're medical or 21 if you're recreational, you are not pregnant, uh, you are not allergic to cannabis. Um, and then the next question though is uh, taking other psychoactive medications. Um, we want at least 72 hours without so that we do the uh, blood test and the saliva test. We don't show a lot of other substances. We don't want the impairment to be um, you know, affected by, by other things. And that's where I'm going to need your help, and that'll all be sent to you for review. Now, as part of the Are You Impaired, we have Marvin Washington, the football player, coming to speak about um, you know, his experiences with cannabis as a neuroprotectant for his uh, chronic pneumonia encephalopathy. Um, we've got Colorado State Patrol involved. Yay! Uh, you've got law enforcement against prohibition, um, and I think normal is sending someone to speak as well. If you would like to speak, uh, let me know. I do need more speakers. Because it's going to take an hour and a half to two hours to put each subject through the battery of tests, which 
includes a 30-minute neurocognition test that has been used for cannabis studies before. We need things for people to do for a couple hours. So we're going to have some speakers. We have the beautiful cars to look at. We're going to have bouncy castle and games out on the lawn, a barbecue, um, those sorts of things. If someone does accidentally take too much, uh, the way that this would happen, the process is if you're a patient, you come in with your symptoms managed after normally using cannabis. If you're a recreational user, you come in without having used cannabis that day. Uh, you run through the battery of tests, which are vital signs, blood draw, um, spit in the hanky for Dr. Cooper, and then you do the neurocognition test, and then you go in with um, a law enforcement officer and do a field sobriety drug recognition test that will be videotaped. Uh, once you do that, Camel Luxury Tours is going to have their um, DAP bus outside, and you can go blaze on, you know, do whatever you want, come back in a self-reported impaired state, and then run through the battery of tests again. We want to see both what impairment looks like and show what impairment looks like to law enforcement, and we want to show them what non-impairment looks like, especially in medical users who may, you know, carry a, a baseline level of cannabinoids that's above that 5 nanogram limit. Should someone accidentally do too much to My friend Sarara kind of outdid me. I made a product called Mary's Rescue a couple years back that was uh, theanine, phosphatidylcholine, glycerophosphocholine because it works faster, magnesium to push cannabinoids out the body pretty quickly, and it worked. It made you must, much less high in about 30 to 45 minutes, and then you were disappointingly less high for several hours afterwards. Well, my friend Sarara one-upped me. <laughs> And she has a product now called Undo that works in three to five minutes. And since I have this ironic problem where I'm actually allergic to cannabis plants, I'm also allergic to hops, I can't drink a beer without getting a rash from the neck down instantly. And I go up in Wisconsin where our baseball team is called the Brewers, so this was a problem. <laughs> But anyway, um, every now and then, uh, if I can get uh, full cannabis, I will vomit within five to ten minutes and almost immediately get a horrible migraine and feel awful. Well, this happened to me uh, last week when we were up in Montrose. Someone gave me a bit of homegrown. Personally, I think it is molds causing this. Uh, personally, because I'm very allergic to molds. Dr. Andrew Monty is our speaker in uh, July, and he is speaking on cannabis hyperemesis. Um, so that's going to be an interesting one, too, because you know I'm, I'm not a hyperemesis. But I took the undo. Five minutes later, I was like on my knees, too dizzy to stand, ready to heave. I took this and laid down, and literally in about five minutes, I got this tingling sensation at the top of my body, and it ran all the way down. Did not throw up. I was still sick, but I was not uncomfortably high anymore. Uh, I still had the migraine, but it was it was better, and it absolutely totally worked. Literally in five minutes. So I have sample packets for you to try. Each one contains two pills. This is something that you can sell in clinic or at a dispensary. But mostly the reason I'm talking about it today, I don't want to promote products here, as you know, you know unless they pay for sponsorship. But um, <laughs> the reason I want to talk about it is because this is going to be our rescue remedy for our impaired day in case someone does accidentally overdo it. So I brought a sample for everyone so that you know what we're giving patients at home. And why do you think that works? Why? Um, we don't know yet. And I am hoping Dr. Olison here, our fabulous speaker, will be able to test it and give us some ideas. It actually seems to reset some of the receptor system. And the reason I say that, it absolutely has nootropic properties. Um, and nootropics can be excitatory to the brain. And that possibly is why it clears that brain fog feeling. Uh, I didn't sleep for two days, but I'm really sensitive to nootropics. <laughs> I, I, I cannot drink caffeinated coffee. I can't take a whole Sudafed, okay? I mean, so for me, that's no big deal. Normal people can sleep after taking this. I am just, you know, a canary. Uh, but it actually seems to reset some of the, I don't know if it's the cannabis pathway or what, uh, because my normal um, headache pills, and I usually take tramadol, I took half as much the next day, and it worked twice as well. Also, I had a glass of wine a couple days later, and I had half a glass of wine because it felt like drinking two. So I'm not sure what it's doing, and we don't know, and I'm hoping we can get some more testing on it. This is made from lichen, the stuff that grows on rocks that, that reindeer eat. Okay, so these are here for everyone. Please take one on your way out. And then hemp connoisseurs, of course, and anyone who did not get a little bit. 
And now, without further ado, I'm very excited about our speaker for tonight. I went down to CSU Pueblo with Lopewood. He was one of the ones I had circled that I was really excited about seeing because anyone who knows me knows that uh, my specialty as a nutritionist is brain nutrition, and I am all about neurotransmitters and peptides and the rogue elements, hormones, and all you know, the three main chemical messengers of the brain. And cannabis and the dopamine pathway is, is a fascinating subject. We know that cannabis affects the GABAergic pathway, but GABA affects dopamine, and dopamine is part of the addiction cycle. And this is what Dr. Olson has studied and what he's going to present to us tonight. So here's Eric from. All right, so you know that. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I uh, regret that I was not able to make it to the uh, cannabis conference down at CSU Pueblo, but I look forward to attending that in the future. Uh, you know, I am a basic scientist, you know, not really a clinician. I uh, study how uh, cannabinoids and other drugs interact with the dopamine system and behavior. I actually did my PhD on uh, cocaine, so I was able to do that very quickly. And then I moved on to studying the uh, cannabis as a uh, postdoctoral researcher. And I'm going to show you some of the data uh, you know, that I've collected there and what uh, is still ongoing in my lab. Uh, but I also want to give you, you know, seeing how I have a full hour, or at least an hour, uh, and we have a more general audience rather than just basic scientists, I wanted to also include sort of a general uh, view that I have on the history of dopamine as a medication from sort of the basic science perspective. Uh, you know, it's been argued that cannabis was uh, likely one of the most, the first plants cultivated by humanity. Uh, some, including Jeffrey Guy, have very elegantly uh, argued that, you know, this might have actually shaped the evolution of our brain, similarly to us selecting cannabis uh, as a plant that we still use today. You know, the Really the idea here is that, you know, our brain is made up by a lot of chemicals. So, you know, the uh, interaction between phytochemicals and our own, uh, you know, brain likely shaped the uh, system that we have in place today. So, I mean, what came first, the endocannabinoid or the delta 98C? And like, what sort of interaction did they have? Of course, this is a very complicated question that's hard to uh, study but I consider the overall idea fascinating, which is why I like to sort of uh, start with that primer. So today specifically, we're going to discuss the history of cannabis as a medicine. Then I'm going to go over what is cannabis chemically. You know, these are first two points you probably all know a lot about, maybe even more than me, so feel free to interrupt at any time. You know, if we can make this a discussion and be interactive, I uh, would love that. Uh, then we'll talk about the effects of cannabis on the dopamine system itself, which is implicated in drug abuse and addiction. Sort of the dogma uh, is that all drugs of abuse increase dopamine transmission within the mesocortical limbic uh, pathway within the brain. There are you know, possibly some exceptions to that, and then how important that is for long-term addiction remains somewhat controversial. But I think uh, in the majority of people, uh, scientists, would agree that uh, the ability of a drug to increase dopamine release is very important uh, to initiate drug abuse in the first place. I'm then going to talk about synthetic cannabinoids, which you know might not be as big of a problem in Colorado now. But I remember when I first moved here, right before cannabis became legal. I moved here from Baltimore. And uh, I noticed a surge of hospitalizations associated with synthetic cannabis use uh, prior to its legalization. At least I saw this in the news. I wasn't in the clinic like you guys. But you know, this would be drugs like K2 and Spice Gold. Things that are still used, I think, by people that are undergoing uh, uh, tests, uh, drug tests regularly. I'd be very interested to know if your NFL player uh, used synthetic cannabinoids ever to sort of skirt those drug tests. And my take-home message there will be that most synthetic cannabinoids are probably much more dangerous than Delta 98 so C itself. Finally, I want to go over the history of endocannab the endocannabinoid system, which is still, you know, an area of discovery, I would say. Probably a lot more is said than is known about the endocannabinoid system at this point. Uh, but at the same point, coming from sort of cocaine and dopamine, which is much more established, 
it's very exciting to be in this. Uh, you know, you, there's still a lot of uh, people stumbling around in the dark. And finally, I will go over some of the, our recent work on the effects of endocannabinoid ma manipulations on dopamine release and behavior. So you know, today, we'll first start by, oh, yes, video camera. <laughs> I'll try to stand still. I'm nervous sometimes when I talk. So uh, let's start by talking about the history of cannabis as a medicine. You know, this has a very long history that you know a lot of you guys have probably thought a lot about. But there are a few landmark discoveries that I think are historically fascinating and you know, just something that everybody should know. You know, the use of uh, cannabis as a medicine I think can unquestionably be linked to. Uh, uh, pyramidal texts uh, from 2350 BC. You know, the first uh, reported documentation of uh, you know, the use of cannabis came from China, but it's unclear if it was actually used as a medicine or just used in rope formation. But in the pyramidal texts, uh, this hieroglyphic here has been identified. I just turned it off. Is there a lid? There. This hieroglyphic here has been identified as Shim Shime, which has been translated to actually refer to cannabis, which, I mean, like, I don't really think it takes a, a, a huge historical scholar here. You have this uh, Egyptian hieroglyphic thing smoking a big doobie. It's uh, you know, just very clearly uh, you know, a symbol of cannabis. But, you know, here is the actual interpretation of their translation. There is a general agreement with the view of Dawson that Shem Shemet means cannabis, and the identification was strongly supported by the use of hemp in rope making, but importantly, as a drug, it has remained in active use ever since uh, for all times. It does not appear very often in their medical papyri, but it was administered by mouth, rectum, vagina, bandaged to the skin, and applied to the eyes, and by fumigation. The next one that I want to point out is uh, you know, a classic religious text, the uh, Atharva Veda from uh, Indian culture. So as uh, some of you might know, there are four uh, Vedas traditionally uh, associated with Indian culture, uh, with the Atharva being the sort of the more spiritual, the, sort of the more far out of the four. But uh, in the passage 11615 from this ancient, ancient text, uh, you know, again, we're back into uh, BC times, you find this translation. We speak to the five kingdoms of the plants, with Soma, the most excellent among them. The Dharma grass, cannabis, and mighty barley, they shall deliver us from anxiety. Again, a bit back here in BC times, thinking about the you know, maybe the use of cannabis, amongst other things, is a pharmacotherapeutic drug for anxiety. The text used the word bong, which is, I think, uh, incredibly important and noteworthy. Uh, you know, bong is still used as a descriptor of cannabis in certain cultures. Uh, you know, one would be Iran, you know, where it is still referred uh, as bong. And uh, bonga, you know, would be a form of cannabis in India. <coughs> And then finally, I, probably one that a lot of you guys are familiar with, uh, William uh, Brooks O'Shaughnessy. This name ring bells? Yeah. So, you know, William Brooks O'Shaughnessy, as many of you probably already know, was an Irish physician that, in my opinion, introduced cannabis as a medicine to the modern Western world. Uh, from my understanding of the historical literature, this was really first introduced as a medicine rather than a recreational drug of abuse. Uh, he moved to Calcutta in 1833 and worked as a professor, scientist, and physician for nine years in India. He used squire's extract, which would be a tincture of uh, hashish, to treat muscle spasticity resulting from tetanus and rabies. He then brought some Indi Indian strains back to England and introduced to modern Europe. Uh, these have since been analyzed using grass chrom chromatography. The remnants were found and uh, they found uh, evidence that these clearly had THC in them, uh, uh, which, you know, uh, like there are claims that there might have been cannabis plants in Europe at this time, primarily used in rope making, making with very little THC content. And as, you know, this audience knows, to this day, spasticity is still accepted by many to be treated, uh, treatable by cannabis, 
Which cannabinoids are important, I think, uh, remains a heated question. Uh, and I don't have a clear answer for you today on that, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but, you know, I think it is worth noting that, you know, cannabis is, as we will discuss in a minute, made up of hundreds of chemicals, the majority of which remain very poorly characterized. And, you know, even the United States government, as you know, uh, you know has uh, recognized various uh, therapeutic values of cannabis, even though it is somehow a Schedule One drug, which seems to be a logical, you know, fallacy. Or, I mean, you know, how, how is that possible that it can have no medicinal value, but yet the, the federal government actually does still mail it out to certain patients every year? Uh, one famous one being Barbara Douglas. And I have, you know, is she still doing? Is she still uh, receiving cannabis? Is she still alive? Does anybody know an update on Barbara Douglas? I don't know, but Irv Rosenthal down in Florida is because he's a patient of Dr. Jeffrey Block, one of our speakers. Yeah, Fascinating. They'll be getting it as well. Fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, like, there's a list. I mean, of uh, you know patients, and I, I think it's been a few presidents uh, since there's been a uh, sort of a new patient added to this sort of distribution by the federal government. But it seems like uh, maybe going from the state approach might be, you know, clearly is working a little better. Finally, uh, you know, I also wanted to put in a plug here for Sativex, uh, one of uh, Jeffrey Guy's uh, companies, uh, GW Pharmaceuticals. Uh, it was approved in 2010 for spasticity associated with multiple sclerosis. I know that it is used in Britain still today. Uh, they also have additional uh, formulations. I think it's important to note that Sativex uh, has about a one-to-one -one ratio between cannabidiol and Delta-9-THC. They do have uh, CBD-specific products as well. They're typically done as sort of like a mouse spray uh, to uh, yeah. administer the capillaries uh, under the tongue and around the mouth. Um, and, you know, I, I've heard Jeffrey guys speak before, and it, it, I, I, I find it interesting, like how important of a role he points out that uh, you know this ratio of CBD to uh, delta 9 THC may play in the uh, therapeutic properties of the drug itself, which is something that I'll come back to in a minute. And this is another one. I, you know, I, how many of you guys have read an issue of the Lancet? Are you guys aware of this article? This is a, a, amazing. Me. This is from the very first edition of the Lancet. It, arguably the world's best known, oldest, and most respected medical journal. It's of a case study uh, reported on by uh, Edward Birch, who's also uh, you know, studying in Calcutta. And he used uh, uh, the cannabis plant to treat opiate poisoning in a sort of a wealthy, royal uh, you know, member of the Calcutta elite. Uh, you know, it, it's a, really a fascinating article. Uh, from the 1800s, uh, showing that you know cannabis, at least in a, a, you know in one person with chronic opium poisoning, a huge problem today, could be weaned off the opium and uh, he begin to function again at a high level in society with cannabis therapy as an agonist therapy in place of the opium. You know, Birch being conservative, he also discusses in the paper, you know, how you might want to mask some of this information from patients, something that you guys would know a lot better than me. Uh, he was a little concerned about abuse. But, uh, you know, it's fascinating to me that, you know, we're still having this debate now, you know, whether or not cannabis could be used as an agonist therapy for this horrible heroin epidemic. I mean, this is from 1889. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So, you know, in, in addition to uh, treating spasticity, and yeah, I, I didn't have anything on inflammation in this intro, but in drug withdrawal, cannabinoids have, as you know, been suggested to play a role in a variety of uh, medicinal or therapeutic effects, including bronchodilation, anti-emetic effects, appetite stimulation, analgesia, decreased spasticity, and decreased intraocular pressure. So what is cannabis? I mean, this is, I think, an important consideration. Everybody, uh, you know, thinks about delta-9 THC, but, you know, there's really a lot more to it. First, I want to give you a little bit of the history of my perspective on the, the taxonomy of cannabis and really 
uh, you know, historically what it is. Uh, it was interesting to hear about the allergic reaction to hops uh, because cannabis is, like hops, a member of the cannabidaceae family, uh, which is, I think, an interesting little fact. Uh, species of cannabis can be very controversial. I think you know, new genetic studies are sort of reshaping some of the views of uh, cannabis itself. Cannabis sativa was uh, first described by Leonard Fuchs in 1542, uh, which was technically 211 years before uh, Linnaeus, who is also sometimes given credit for its first characterization. Cannabis indica was first described as distinct by Lamarck, who you might remember from Intro to Biology, who came up with the idea or the concept of Lamarckian genetics. He was also the first to uh, you know, really classify cannabis indica as a distinct species. And you know, again, I think that genetic studies could uh, reshape a lot of this. And let's also not forget about ruderalis over there, which is really not thought to have much THC content at all. But you know, it could be uh, you know, it does produce other cannabinoids. It could also be quite interesting. Generally speaking, uh, historically, sativa was tall and branched and used for fiber, seed, and rope, whereas indica had more of the one-to-one -one THC to CBD ratio that was first used and reported to have therapeutic benefits by O'Shaughnessy, uh, and it is likely that it did have approximately that ratio, still with a high CBD content. You know, now THC is, of course, being genetically manipulated primarily to increase THC content or, thankfully, also beginning to test different combinations of different cannabinoids, like controlling the THC to cannabidi uh, cannabidiol ratio. I think a lot of very smart people uh, are really devoting their lives to make the development of different genetic makeups of cannabis. I would say arguably more than those working with uh, some of our, our classic crops, like corn. Uh, you know, it, I think it's just fascinating to think about all the brain power involved in developing different strains of cannabis right now. It's fascinating. So the cannabinoids themselves are produced uh, in these trichromes that you see, uh, you know, the little crystals. They would actually be, uh, you know, produced by a combination of terpenes and phenols that would be, uh, you know, sort of combined uh, with uh, the, the necessity of light, or the UV rays, then that would actually go on to create the specific cannabinoids. The, uh, the complete genetics of this has also been uh, very well mapped out, but I'm not going to bore you with that today. So you know, there are various cannabis preparations, as you guys all know. Bomb we've already referred to. Uh, you, know, you might think of this as with historical slang names like grass. You know, this would be a seeded mixture of cannabis flowers, leaves, and stems. Then you have ganja, or sensimilla, uh, without seed, which would be the unfertilized female flowering tops from the plant itself. And charis, or soap bar, uh, hashish in Arabic. Uh, this would actually be the cannabis resin removed from the actual tripods. Now, we now know of a variety of newer preparations, uh, you know, sifted in water, uh, extracted hash. These are, there are various ways that uh, people are isolating trichromes now. And, you know, really I think the things that you see most these days uh, in the dispensaries would be uh, this hash oil, wax, or shatter. Uh, you know, various ways of just uh, extracting the pure uh, trichromes and uh, cannabinoids themselves. So what is cannabis chemically? Uh, there are thought to be over uh, 400 different chemicals in cannabis, including about 60 that would be classified as phytocannabinoids. Delta 9 THC, as you know, is uh, thought to be responsible for the psychoactive effects of cannabis itself, uh, whereas cannabidiol is thought to produce more anti inflammatory and additional effects. This is something that I. I, I find a little frustrating. Uh, the cannabidiol literature, in my mind, is a little unsatisfying at this point. I, I would say that, again, a lot more is said than is known about uh, what cannabidiol is doing. Uh, you know, I, I think that a lot more needs to be discovered before we really have a, a greater grasp on what cannabidiol is really binding to and doing in the, the body. 
Uh, THC breaks down to cannabinol over time. So cannabinol is what they actually uh, screened for and found in O'Shaughnessy's product that he brought from India. It would be you know, the breakdown product of uh, cannabis itself. Uh, you know, here is just a, sort of a breakdown of several uh, uh, marijuana co constituents that I uh, understand that you guys probably know more about this than I do, but I understand that some of these are being uh, tested, uh, you know, by actual dispensaries and uh, uh, companies that are involved in actually segregating some of these chemicals from the cannabis plant. Uh, I know a former student of mine is working with, uh, I think, Edipirio? What One of these uh, uh, companies, especially assessing the role of terpenes, which, from what I understand, uh, might give the cannabis more of that sort of citrusy smell. Uh, that's just one of eight. One of eight. That's just, you know, the other ones are like pinene and mercy. Ah. They all, that's what gives it its, its smell. Very, yeah, fascinating. And, you know, aside from the smell, do you, are you familiar with any, like, you know, physiological or behavioral effects. And they all have distinct physiological effects yeah. that and some of the THC and the anti some they have their own medicinal properties. We, we had Dr. Stephen Bennett, a PhD, and for a turkey lecture in January. I wish I did not miss that. That would have been, yeah, very interesting. I was about to say, you guys are really nice. And that really is the controlling, what, that's the new frontier within cannabis research as we move forward is the terpene levels because if you can find myrcene, which is going to be more anti-inflammatory, or linalool, it's going to be more anti-anxiety. And if you have a good nose, as well as the test, then you can pair up THC and CBD with the terpene and go from there. Awesome. Uh, honestly, I've got, a, I've got a hypothesis on this. We know that cannabinoids themselves affect neurotransmitters through various pathways, uh, but the other actions of cannabis, some of which are medical, uh, peptides in the brain are what cause thirst, mm -hmm. hunger, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. red eyes, mm -hmm. dry mouth, mm -hmm. things like that. And I believe that the terpenes are developing peptides at the same time that the cannabinoids are developing neurotransmitters, and that's part of the synergistic effect. But I can't prove it yet, so if we've got a way to do some research on that, that would be awesome. Fascinating. I, I actually I am work, doing some work right now with a, a neuropeptide called a, a repsin or a hypocretin. Mm -hmm. You heard of this? Uh, you know, it seems to have pretty comparable effects to endocannabinoids on the dopamine system. Uh, uh, you know, something we can talk more about we'll later. Talk more about later. It, yeah. You know, yeah, uh, very interesting. So, you know, as you know, you know, delta 9 THC is typically associated with the main psychoactivity <coughs> uh, associated with cannabis. With cannabidiol still being, you know, to me, it's still a little bit more of a mystery at the mechanistic physiological level. And of course, there's some great like correlation of, uh, observation studies out there. But I, I still remain unsatisfied with uh, sort of mechanistically what's going on. This slide I stole from a scientist called Rob Hampson about uh, eight years ago, uh, describing the delta-9 THC versus CBD content in some of the common strains that were being marketed in Vancouver, I believe is where this was from. Uh, it's striking to me, well, you know, at the time we were observing just the striking effect uh, or you know the trend of increasing THC content at the expense of other cannabinoids like uh, cannabidiol and whether or not this would actually be you know medically uh, helpful you know versus for example Sativex where you might have more than one-to-one -one ratio but I think it's also striking to note that uh, you know just in a few years those THC contents have doubled I mean what, what is the average THC content in Denver now 20 20 21 percent Oh, yeah, I, I, that, that's fascinating. I, and I, I do uh, find it uh, very promising and uh, you know, it's great that people are starting to explore other you know, ratio manipulations like increasing cannabidiol content rather than just sort of eliminating it at the expense of driving THC up. You know, here's a graph, again, you know, this continues to grow. Here, we're only at 10% uh, in 2009, and again, here in Denver, you know, we're probably already up to 20%. But the potency of cannabis in the United States has increased really exponentially over the last decade or so. This has caused some people, uh, you know, reason for concern. You know, the, the cannabis that was first really brought over to Europe uh, was thought to have this sort of one-to-one -one ratio of THC and cannabidiol. 
you know, in North America, due to selective breeding, a lot of this has been bred out, and THC is at undocumentedly high levels. It remains unclear, I think, how, like what effect that really has. Uh, I guess we're in that experiment right now. We're living that. But you know, some, and I'm not necessarily getting on the soapbox here, but you know, some have argued that this shifted uh, ratio will increase risk for psychosis in populations like here. You probably all know that, yes? <clears throat> when I look at your chart, and you always, when you're looking at chart statistics, you're looking for some kind of specific trend. And one of the questions that I have if you look at when the trend changes is that we start um, also adjusting the accuracy and the calibration of the instruments. And also at that point, um, we started to use HDLC, which are tests for acids. So when you see a comparison of current THC to the THC that we saw nine years ago, which is obviously done with GC, because that's anything anybody had, it's not a fair comparison. So you have to take today's THC AL, multiply it by the whatever t uh, the 0.87 to get a comparison. So <clears throat> saying that the rising numbers, and then you also have to look at the marketing value of the increase, and we're estimating right now it's about a 4% increase at the higher numbers of false numbers for the THC. So I always like to look at those numbers with a grain of salt and the current trends and doing any kind of tracking at this point until we get that dialed in is probably going to be false numbers. So anyway, if you look at the numbers and you know finally we're getting HPLCs and calibrations, we got um, we've got standards now for ten. We're just five years ago we had four. You know we barely had two ten years ago. We had THC and CBD. That's the only thing you test and look at your chart. You know it reflects that. And now we're looking for everything else that's in the plant. So we're seeing a large rise in CBDAs and stuff like that in the plants that we're growing. So plus it's the PGRs, PGRs. I mean that's. They're accelerating the growth on plant purpose. Growth. They're manipulating the plant with chemicals uh -huh. and hormones and terrible crap. So I don't so know, man. You so can't test it based on comparison. Yes, it's not a fair testing. So the, I don't believe that. So exactly. Anyway, that's a, it's an interesting Sorry. point that we sure. deal with all the time. Of yeah, the technology, the detection technology could have been. Especially if you yeah. test the potency in comparison to what happened in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Right. Because mm -hmm. they just did basic hemp and used the whole plant and munched the whole plant. Right. Everything. So, out, out of no, curiosity, oh, no, it, it, does anybody know in this room the current the THC content of the federally provided cannabis? Like, from my understanding? Well, Three. Yeah, I thought it was more like 25 percent. Plus, it was covered in PM. They could have tested probably because it was covered in PM. Anyone who saw our March lecture with Dr. Daniela Vergara, who is the cannabis genome tester, she showed the genetic markers for NIDA weed compared to Colorado, Seattle, Washington, and Oakland, California. And it was just crazy, the difference between them all. So, yeah, I, I find it very frustrating as a basic researcher. I mean, like, we have vapor exposure systems to, first, I mean, like, cannabis is a difficult uh, drug to study in animals. First of all, rodents typically do not self-administer Delta 9 THC itself. There are studies, it's one of the only drugs studied in which rats will not self-administer. There is a recent study coming out of the Medical University of South Carolina that does show under certain conditions they can get you know, some you know, minor self-administration. Uh, group, a group in uh, Italy has shown that the synthetic cannabinoid 1552122 will be, uh, self, is self-administered uh, by rats, surprisingly. Uh, interesting, like some group, uh, a, a group from the National Institute on Drug Abuse has shown that uh, monkeys will self-administer the drug. But my point here is that it is difficult to have sort of a delivery system where the animal is actually contingently taking the drug to assess its effect on the brain. Therefore, we've developed these vapor exposure systems where we can expose the animals to the drug vapor and then look for neural changes over time. But the frustration there is I can still only, you know, I have a Schedule One drug license. It's actually easier for me, I think, to get heroin right now than cannabis. And if I got the night of cannabis, it's not like I really want to study. Like, yours, if we were to accept it, I mean, the night of cannabis is still like, there's sort of this historic 5% uh, sort of older, your, your grandfather's cannabis, if you will, uh, you know, is that even relevant? Is it even valid to be doing those tests? Uh, you know, Right. It would be very nice if we could use the strains here, but I cannot. 
I have a federally funded lab. If I use this stuff from across the street, they can shut down my lab. I can only use drugs from my research that are provided by the federal government. Anyway, onward. Yes. We're all frustrated by that. Right. So the, uh, you know, as you know, this link between psychosis and uh, cannabis use was first reported by the Swedish conscript study. So here, you know, they uh, all, the uh, Swedish citizens, you know, had to do this sort of fixed period of service for their country. During this period of time, they started screening longitudinally, uh, you know, the uh, conscripts on a variety of factors. And one correlation that they found was that those who had uh, reported heavy cannabis use during adolescence showed an increased risk for schizophrenia later in adulthood. This was repeated by a British group in uh, Dunedin, uh, New Zealand. You guys might know of this study. But they found that there's actually a genetic uh, uh, you know, uh, haplotype of the COMT uh, genotype. COMT is a enzyme that would be involved in the breakdown of certain chemicals, including <coughs> dopamine, which is thought to be apparently high in uh, schizophrenic patients that are expressing symptoms of psychosis. You know, uh, so some, at least, have argued that we might actually see an increase in the risk of uh, schizophrenia due to high THC content, uh, especially in regions like Denver and Seattle. I don't know if any of these trends have started to emerge. Any evidence? None? Don't buy it? No? I have no dog in that fight. Can I ask another tough question? Please. Um, in these studies, the one thing that we found is a lot of times if you use impurities on whatever that they're growing, smoke on, so, so if it's not controlled and it's self-administered, and also they don't separate skunk, which in England is classified as skunk, but it's actually um, spice that they smoke, so you see people that um, exhibit um, uh, psychosis and different things from smoking psychosis. And that comes from the high synthetic. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the yeah. idea is that we haven't corrected for those problems when it comes to um, drug testing. So we drug test people so they smoke um, spice or synthetics. Sure. Which could be much worse. It's highly illegal. I, I agree. Honestly, That's something we're going to get to. Honestly, there was another study done in Sweden, a, a huge study that was done over time. And it was on, once again, they were talking with people who were diagnosed schizophrenic later in life and what their cannabis consumption was earlier. But what they found was, if you are schizophrenic, you were more likely to use cannabis. So it was kind of a chicken and egg situation. So you couldn't figure out if the schizophrenia caused the cannabis use or the cannabis caused the schizophrenia. Absolutely. So first break is like 18 years old or 18 to 21 years old. So, yeah, so that's the exactly. first break. Exactly, first psychotic breaks are typically between 18 and 22, yeah. 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 So, so we don't know. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's my uh, interpretation. It's still sort of like this chicken and egg question with no real answer. Uh, important stuff to think about, I think, but uh, yeah. Anyway, so now let me talk about uh, something that you might not know as much about, the effects of cannabis on the dopamine system, which I've already said is implicated in drug addiction uh, and also in schizophrenia. So it's long been demonstrated that cannabinoids, including uh, you know, synthetic cannab cannabinoids and phytocannabinoids, increase dopamine uh, concentration. Here, this is a microdialysis study taken from the lab of uh, uh, Di Chiara in Italy, just showing that you know, a single treatment uh, with a synthetic cannabinoid, WIN552122, increases dopamine concentration in the uh, main uh, output region of the ventral tegmental area dopamine neurons, the ventral striatum. You see similar effects if you're actually measuring the dopamine neural activity, again sort of confirming, I would argue unquestionably, that cannabinoids increase dopamine concentration in the brain. This is actually a, a contentious point, uh, you know, at a point during the late 80s, Elliot Gardner from the National Institute on Drug Abuse reported a paper, the first that I'm aware of, showing dopamine concentrations increase in the brain. There was another uh, you know, group reporting the exact opposite effect in that uh, same journal. They've been discredited, and I don't even remember their names. Uh, you know, Gardner, I think, was the first to really report this effect. Can I ask you a question? Yes. When you talk about dopamine, can we assume that your, the other neurotransmitters fall, fall into line? Or are you just specifically talking about dopamine and not serotonin and not norepinephrine and things like that? Specifically talking, like that. yeah, just specifically talking about dopamine. Yes, 
like the you know as you guys probably are well aware, I mean like the connect the CB1 receptor is arguably the most widespread metabotropic receptor in the brain. Uh, you know I think it has a lot of effects. I'm just going to be talking about the ones on dopamine release, but you know by no means do I think that this is the end all be all of how cannabis is producing its effects. No, it's just isolated. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. You know, the dopamine effects that I'm going to show you today are a little different from what I just reported there. Uh, we're, here we're using a little better technology to, that can assess real-time changes in dopamine release. Here you can see they were taking samples every 10 minutes. Now we can sample in real time. So real-time assessments show that uh, uh, cannabinoids increase both the frequency and amplitude of bursts of dopamine release, which is one of the main signaling mechanisms through which dopamine transmission occurs and is likely very important for uh, directing motivated behaviors and also probably psychosis. Once again, this work was all done with synthetic cannabinoids, not whole plant medicines, so we don't have the entourage effect in play here. No entourage effect in play in uh, any of these studies. Okay. Uh, you know, to really uh, do that well, I would say you, I, I, it could be it could be done. It has not been done well. Uh, I would love to study the entourage effect. Uh, you know, it, it's. Uh, Studying the entourage effect on dopamine release is actually something that I proposed for a little local cannabinoid grant here by the state. It was not selected for funding, but you know, <laughs> yeah, we'll try it again. <laughs> exactly. They don't want neurotransmitters right now. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, it, I think it was a little more basic and mechanistic for what they wanted, but uh, anyway. And then also, if you actually measure the dopamine neural activity rather than the dopamine release itself, again. Synthetic cannabinoids will increase the uh, bursting of dopamine neural activity. Would love to study the entourage effect. Uh, really, I mean, the effect of uh, some people still believe that uh, CBD might actually uh, reduce the effects of THC on dopamine release. To me, this question has not been adequately addressed. I don't have an answer there. I would love to address that. So, how is this actually occurring? This is a, a mechanism of, uh, you know, basically what's known as DSI, or depolar like, uh, uh, depolarization induced suppression of inhibition. The idea here is that the dopamine neurons, which you can see are represented, uh, dopamine neuron here, actually lack CB1 receptors. That's sort of the dogma. Whereas the CB1 receptors in the midbrain are expressed on GABA neurons and also a smaller population of glutamate neurons which I'm going to exclude here for the sake of simplicity. But they, you have to keep that in the back of your mind that these are also expressed on glutamate neurons, which would, in theory, be having the opposite effect of GABA neurons on dopamine release. GABA, as you may recall, is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter of the, in the brain and would uh, typically inhibit uh, dopamine release. So the idea here is when uh, an action potential occurs, there would be a release of GABA through a cal uh, calcium dependent mechanism that would then suppress the firing of dopamine neural activity. There is always a general suppression uh, you know, under baseline conditions. If THC binds to the uh, CB1 receptor, uh, and THC has been studied in isolation, but again not with the, the a full entourage effect, this tends to inhibit the release of GABA uh, which would then lead to increased dopamine neural activity. The endocannabinoids are uh, funky, and you know I'm sort of skipping ahead here. I'm going to get to endocannabinoids later. But endocannabinoids are, are really funky in that they're one of the uh, rare neurotransmitter molecules that is, are expressed postsynaptically. They're actually thought to be synthesized on demand during periods of high neuronal activity uh, they actually activate, a, leads to the activation of an enzyme called diacylglycerol lipase, which would then lead to the reduction of glycerol and anandamide, which then can be uh, retrogradely transmitted to activate on CB1 receptors and decrease GABA transmission, thereby sort of act functioning, functioning as an amplifier of dopamine neural activity by taking off those GABAergic breaks. How exactly the endocannabinoids are transported remains a little controversial. 
Uh, I've done a little bit of work with an uh, endocannabinoid uptake inhibitor called VDM11. There is some evidence that there might actually be an endocannabinoid transporter that facilitates its release. It could be targeted uh, you know, pharma uh, pharmacologically, but all of that still remains incredibly controversial. These are lipophilic compounds or molecules that you know, can, in theory, pass just simply through the plasma membrane. Uh, and in fact, Giovanni Marsicano's group in France has demonstrated that these can even bind to receptors expressed on mitochondria themselves, which from a health perspective I think is fascinating, based on the idea that uh, mitochondrial dysfunction could actually be associated with a lot of uh, neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, so, you know, here is just a more simple cartoon, uh, you know, I think overviewing the same effect but with simpler animation. So here you see WEN552122 binding to a CB1 receptor, which are typically GI or GO associated. Lynn Howard and others have shown that they can also sometimes be associated with the GQ uh, subunit complex. But this would decrease the release of GABA and thereby disinhibit the dopamine neuron postsynaptic. So now I want to show you some of the effects of synthetic cannabinoids on dopamine release. Uh, and, uh, the reason is that, you know, outside of Colorado, synthetic cannabinoids are still widely used. And I think they're still widely used here, as someone alluded to, to get around uh, drug tests. According to the Monitoring the Future study in 2012, synthetic cannabinoids were actually the second most commonly used illicit drug reported by high school seniors, second only to cannabis itself. You're probably most familiar with K2 and Spice Gold, which were, uh, are, are really uh, synthetic compounds that were first created by a chemist by a Clemson University called John Huffman. The poor guy, in my opinion, was really just sort of picked on. You know, there are a lot of different uh, cannabinoids that resemble the uh, JWH73 and JWH18 compounds. These were the first two, or the two that were most commonly expressed in K2 and Spice. There are many other similar uh, chemicals out there that do the same thing. WIN552122 is one of the, probably the best used, or most commonly used in the basic science literature. And you'll also notice that these all come in very different shapes and sizes. and can be separated on class based off of their organic chemical structure. And this class all seems to function as full agonists at the cannabinoid CB1 receptor, whereas delta-9-THC and HU210 uh, are partial agonists. And HU210 would be a synthetic cannabinoid that more resembles delta-9-THC. Why they're not putting this in the spice gold, I don't know. But it's a, a very huge effect. Uh, you know, GTP gamma S here would be an expression of how active the sort of the postsynaptic response is to the binding of the ligand to the receptor. So what you can see here is a list of, of varieties of cannabinoids. WIN552122, again, would be the one that would resemble the Hoffman compounds the most. You can see that this is really the only drug tested here that produces a full activation at the CB1 receptor. And now compare that to what you actually get with uh, delta-9-THC itself shown in these little dark triangles. It's you know, a magnitude of a smaller effect on the activation following binding to the CD1 receptor. Has anybody read this book? No. Well, I wanted to use this as a, a, a segue into uh, you know, a little effect that I wanted to show you next on synthetic cannabinoids on timing behavior and dopamine as it relates to timing behavior. So this book was written by uh, a, a physician by the name of Marur. Uh, he, his nickname was Maro de Tours. I have a copy of this, uh, if you would like one. It's in French. I'm not aware of the translation to English yet, but Google Scholar is pretty awesome. So in 1845, uh, in Paris, a group of uh, uh, hash eaters was established. They called themselves the Club de Hashishans. Uh, Moreau de Tours was a member of this, and as a physician, was very interested in sort of the behavioral and uh, you know uh, physiological effects of cannabis. So he and some of his buddies that you might remember from uh, college, like Hugo and Dumas, would get together and eat a bunch of hashish, and then they would document, sit around, and document the effects. They devoted an entirely 
an entire chapter in this book that is incredibly long-winded to the effects of uh, cannabis on timing behavior. And uh, you know, I think the direct, one of the direct quotes was, you know, it, it uh, makes it feel, feel like the room is slowing down, like time is passing by more slowly. So he decided to actually test the effects of uh, WIN 552122 on dopamine release and timing behavior using something called a fixed interval task. This is a task where uh, an animal, as you can see up above, is responding for sugar pellets, but the sugar pellet only comes every 30 seconds. What happens is the animal responds faster and faster and faster over that 30 second period, which you can see down here. During that time, our measure of dopamine release actually is decreasing as a function uh, in an inversely proportional manner to this sort of scalloped response pattern that you see over the course of 30 seconds until the animal receives a sugar pellet and then you see this big surge of dopamine release and uh, the animal will take a break and then start responding again. So, you know, I, I, I think I got all of my predictions on this one wrong. I thought the dopamine was going to increase proportionally to response output that occurred in an inversely proportional manner. And I also thought that cannabis would slow down timing behavior, also the opposite of what we found. But here are just the overall effects of what you observe on dopamine release during this timing task. So as the animal responds faster over the time of that fixed interval, dopamine release is decreased in an inversely proportional manner. And then if you look at what happens when we give various doses of WIN552122, that again a full agonist to the CD1 receptor, this greatly amplifies dopamine release and this temporal pattern of dopamine release that accompanies the acceleration of timing behavior. We then mapped the acceleration of timing behavior using a, a, a sort of a nonlinear model. Uh, here, a negative slope would mean that the animal's timing behavior is accelerated, that the animal is sort of peaking their response behavior at, uh, earlier into the interval, whereas a positive uh, shift would suggest that the animal is timing their behavior more slowly. Interestingly, we found that when 552122 sort of increased when the animal would peak, increased that uh, peak response period, which is somewhat counterintuitive to what you think about as uh, cannabis is something that slows timing behavior. Whether or not this is really uh, an artifact of it being a synthetic cannabinoid versus uh, uh, THC itself is a possibility, but it is worth noting that there are uh, a, a, a few clinical studies where uh, they would actually study tapping behavior in patients using cannabis and similarly to our findings here, they reported that their tapping behavior would increase uh, earlier when they were trying to sort of time an interval versus uh, what they did when they were in a drug-free state. One possible interpretation to this could be that, you know, there could be uh, actually a facilitation of uh, timing, like you actually might feel like you are moving faster through time, which makes, provides the perception the time around you is moving slower. It's a pretty heady philosophical concept, but uh, at least one worth considering. Now, importantly to clinical use, or you know, uh, we did. Uh, this is a recent study that we've yet to publish, uh, but we wanted to ask the question: What effect does repeated treatment with synthetic cannabinoids have on dopamine release and cannabimimetic effects uh, after subchronic treatment? So what we did is I treated animals, uh, two groups of rats, either with vehicle or WIN552122, uh, over nine treatments. Uh, the first one given it uh, Zeitgeber times zero, meaning like basically when the animal wakes up in the morning, in this case a nocturnal rat, uh, the light's going down, and then 10 hours into the light cycle. I increased uh, the dosage uh, over time, and uh, you know, at, especially at the highest dose, you know, you observed a very uh, strong cannabimimetic profile. So how do you measure a cannabimimetic profile in a rat? This uh, is a classic test called the Tetrad test. Has anybody heard of the Tetrad test? No. The Tetrad test was uh, uh, developed by really who I would call sort of the forefather of cannabis behavioral pharmacology. 
at least at the basic science level. A guy by the name of Billy Martin, who just passed away a few years ago. Billy Martin uh, was the head of uh, pharmacology at Virginia Commonwealth University for a long period of time. And uh, was you know, succeeded now by Aaron Lichtman, who is doing an excellent job sort of filling his shoes. And what Billy Martin developed over the course of a 30-year career is known as the Tetrad Test. What he found is that all cannabinoids produce four effects. They produce antinociception, analgesia, which I don't have plotted, plotted here, catalepsy, and hypothermia. So I wanted to first catalepsy. Could you say catalepsy? Yes, catalepsy. Uh, sort of uh, think uh, you know, yeah, like statue-like behavior. It's sort of like something that you would be, uh, uh, envision the beginning of the movie Awakenings. Uh, you see very stiff, catatonia. rigid, like yeah, catatonia. like catatonia. Got it. Thanks. Yes. How about antinociception? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Antinociception. Pain release. Pain release. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, here, sorry, the, I guess the one that I am missing here is uh, decreased locomotor activity, something else that we uh, addressed. So aninociception, here we're just assessing pain by placing the animal on a hot plate. We measure how long it takes the animal to withdraw from the hot plate with the idea that the longer they stay on it, the less pain they are feeling. Catalepsy, we place the animal on a 10 centimeter bar and uh, measure how long it takes the animal to withdraw from the bar. A very cataleptic animal will hang there with haloperidol, which produces severe catalepsy. Uh, at a high dose, you know, you sort of have to take the animal down after five minutes, so just sit there. Uh, and I will say, uh, having measured both, cannabis-induced catalepsy is different than haloperidol-induced catalepsy. Very different. Uh, overall, I, I don't know how better to describe this, but the animal is more rigid throughout their body on cannabis. It's sort of, you almost have to position them on the bar properly to get them to stay there because their entire body seems more rigid than when they're on haloperidol. And hypothermia there, we just take a rectal temperature and uh, all cannabinoids are known to decrease uh, body temperature in the rat. So the pink uh, lines here show the effects of the animals that have been treated with vehicle versus those that have been treated with uh, synthetic cannabinoids subchronically. As you can see, uh, cannabis is much less effective at reducing pain in these uh, animals that have been repeatedly treated with when. Exact same is true for catalepsy and hypothermia. So we're getting profound tolerance to the cannabimetic profile of canna cannabis. Uh, as assessed by Billy Martin's Tetrad test. So what, if, what effects on uh, dopamine release? Do you actually observe tolerance to the dopamine releasing effects of cannabis itself? The answer is yes. So here you can see, uh, again, the vehicle treated animals in pink compared to those that received this subchronic wind exposure in green. No difference early on, which was uh, interesting to me. I actually predicted that we would observe a decrease in regular dopamine release in the uh, uh, subchronic wind treated animals. It's possibly that this is a uh, lack of effect. It's really due to a floor effect. Uh, you know, it's a little hard to tease apart the difference between three to five transient release events. Um, you know, here you can see the effects of 0.2 milligram per kilogram wind in a vehicle treated animal. You see a rapid increase in dopamine release that remains elevated. Uh, interestingly, this does not parallel the cannabimetic profile. You see a decrease in dopamine release before you see uh, some of these cannabimetic effects uh, wear off. Uh, and again, you know, suggesting, yes? I'm sorry, brother. Could you just say a sentence or two more about what exactly wind is? Yes. Wind 552122 is a uh, probably in the basic science literature, the most studied synthetic cannabinoid. It is a uh, full agonist to the cannabinoid CB1 receptor. It, uh, unlike delta 19 which would be a partial agonist, it is very structurally similar to the uh, John Huffman's compounds. Uh, the JWH, what, what, 17, and uh, I, I forget the exact numbers. He made hundreds of them. But the two of his that were most commonly uh, used in spice gold and K2 are very structurally similar to wind. So I would say that wind is like spice gold. 
So the, uh, the take home message from this is I would argue that repeated use of uh, uh, spikes or K2 or synthetic cannabinoids can produce profound tolerance on the dopamine system, uh, which you know, could be, uh, and it's unknown what really happens with repeated cannabis exposure. Again, something that I would love to do, especially with the vapor exposure systems and the overall entourage effect. I mean, like, how know, who knows if uh, there's actually some uh, counteractivity here that would, uh, you know, uh, prevent this profound tolerance on uh, dopamine release. Where do you put marinol and those synthetic substances when you're talking about wind and other sure. synthetic so correct me if I'm wrong, but Marinol is pure delta 9 THC? No, it is a synthetic, it is a synthetic THC that has been available by prescription since the 1970s. But it's a synthetic delta 9. But it's a synthetic right. delta 9. So yes. my question is, is that degree of tolerance, does that relate to the degree of affinity of the CB1 receptor? And if that's the case, uh, is the if that's the case, Win 55 should uh, create greater tolerance, having greater affinity than Delta 9, having lesser affinity, and therefore Marinol would provide lesser. I, I agree. I, I think the effects of Marinol would be uh, about that much less. You know, I, I think you're right that it would be directly related to. Uh, ability uh, to activate the binding affinity. Exactly, the binding affinity, and also you know, yes, absolutely. Uh, and I, I definitely think that the effects that we see with the synthetic cannabinoid would be much more profound. With wind, would be much more profound than the synthetic cannabinoid uh, delta 9 THC or the synthetic molecule resembling delta 9 THC. And we think this is directly affecting the dopamine levels rather than doing so through anandamide? I, 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 I do. I do think that. Uh, I have tried uh, to assess the effects of both anandamide and glucoprane. So yes, I do think that it is directly due to activation of the CB1 receptor. In my studies, when I'm given when, if I uh, then give uh, AM251, or SR141716, Ramanavan, I can completely uh, reverse the effects of wind on dopamine release. I, like, I, I am pretty confident that it's primarily a CB1 dependent effect. I've also assessed anandamide and its role on dopamine release. Interestingly, uh, I have not actually observed an effect of anandamide on dopamine release in the awakened behaving animal. I have seen pretty profound effects of 2AG, uh, which is something I, I can talk a little bit more about. Wait, say it again. Uh, I, when I have tried to measure the effects of the two primary endocannabinoids, anandamide and 2-AG, I see effects with 2-AG. I don't see any effects with anandamide. This could be due to the effect, the idea that 2-AG is a, a full agonist and therefore you know, would likely produce more you know, potent effects. It could also be have a lot to do with the fact that I'm trying to increase these levels using enzymatic inhibitors, and 2-AG is expressed more in the midbrain than is anandamide. Uh, you know, which is also, and that's actually true throughout the brain. 2-AG is expressed in higher levels. So it could be a dosing effect, it could be uh, the pharmacological tools that I'm using to elevate, like my FAW inhibitors aren't uh, doing an adequate job. I've even tried to infuse uh, anandamide directly into the ventral tegmental area. Like I bought a I minute mean, and just infused it in and saw no effect. Uh, but then again, it probably was rapidly metabolized before I could observe an effect. So, but yeah, to date, I have actually not observed an effect of the hand of my on dopamine okay. in my hands. But I'm glad that we're talking about this because now I want to get into the endocannabinoid system uh, here. So, you know, as you may know, uh, you know, really the history of how cannabinoids produce their effects uh, is really very new and still, we're still in the stage of development. Uh, you know, back in the 1970s and early 1980s, one of the leading thoughts was that uh, uh, cannabinoids, or delta 9 THC, produced its effects by altering membrane fluidity. So you alter membrane fluidity and you act sort of fuzzy and hot. Uh, it made a lot of sense at the time, I guess. 
you know, uh, and then I also want to point out that in the 1970s, sort of uh, not completely knowing what they were doing, Pfizer developed some of the first synthetic analogs that would be used to address the cannabinoid system. <coughs> Then in 1985, uh, a woman by the name of Alyn Howlett, anybody know this name? Alyn Howlett? She was on my PhD committee, so I want to give her a plug. But she uh, actually discovered that uh, Delta-9-THC is binding to a G-protein coupled with cannabinoid receptor. That receptor would then go on to be cloned by Rafe Mishulam to first visualize it. But uh, Alyn's really the first person to show that uh, delta 9 was binding to a G protein coupled receptor in the brain rather than just altering membrane fluidity. In 1992, the first uh, 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 endocannabinoid was then identified again by Rafe Meshulam. Uh, you know, that guy had a, a heck of a career, really. I mean, uh, but anyway, he uh, isolated and named anandamide, which means bliss. Then the uh, first antagonist of the, uh, of the CB1 receptor was discovered, called SR, or developed, called SR1417-16, later renamed Ramanavant, also known by its trade name, Acomplia. Uh, this was in a very important uh, in the, in the try trying to, to understand how endocannabinoids work, because it provided the first tool that we could use at a basic science level to theoretically block endocannabinoids from binding to the CB1 receptor to see what happens. I mean, before that, you, I mean, and this is just, you know, really a couple de decades ago. Then, tuaracodonyl glycerol was discovered in 1995, and I would argue that uh, tuaracodonyl glycerol is the most abundant uh, uh, endocannabinoid currently, that we currently know about in the brain. There are probably many more that have yet to be discovered. But anandamide and tuaracodonyl glycerol are the most important, uh, are the most well characterized at this point. 2-AG is much more abundant and thought to be much more important for synaptic plasticity. I am somewhat biased here. Uh, at the Gordon Conference series, they, they have a Gordon on just on cannabinoids. So at this meeting, we break up uh, in the middle. Uh, it's sort of a big, big deal. At the end of the week, this week-long conference, we break up into teams, the anandamide team versus the tuaracodonyl glycerol team and we battle. Uh, you know, 2 he always wins. But, uh, you know, as you probably know, in 2005, Ramanavant was uh, considered uh, by the DA, DA for use in smoking cessation. Uh, you know, it, it was also shown to be very effective for uh, eating disorders in addition to a variety of other addictions. You know, it, it began to be marketed pretty heavily in Europe under the, the name Accomplia, uh, and here are the reasons that I think it is effective. Uh, so here's one of uh, my animals. You can see uh, now we've switched it up to rats, but here we would have, uh, you know, the animal is responding for, in this case, something called brain stimulation reward, a very potent reward where we actually deliver circuit uh, electrical stimulation to their actual dopamine neurons. You can observe two dopamine responses, one to a reward predictive cue light, and then one to the actual delivery of reward itself. That cue evoked dopamine response is thought to be integral in promoting craving or reward craving. Uh, the idea here would be that this would be the Ben and Jerry sign or the beer logo. It's that that like this is that that whatever it is uh, you know this. So now watch what happens when we give Ramanavan. So you saw the animal responded very quickly after you turn on that cue light, and you saw that big increase in dopamine release to the cue. Now, I had just delivered IV Ramanavant. You can see I, I insert a, a jugular catheter into their jugular vein, so without interacting with the animal, I can administer drugs and all look at the real-time effects on dopamine release and behavior. As you can see, it seems like the cue is pretty unaffected. Uh, it seems like the, the, the cue or that beer sign, the Ben and Jerry's logo, is no longer effective at motivating the animal's reward-seeking response. And you also observe there was no dopamine response to the cue, but we are still able to detect dopamine when the animal actually responds for the reward itself. Here I have uh, you know, one more, I believe, trial here. Again, you can see that the cue is definitely not affecting the behavior as strongly. So this is one reason, and here are my overall mean data. Uh, you can see that uh, with Ramanavan, uh, this significantly 
uh, increased how long it took the animal to respond for the reward after presenting that reward predictive cue and decreased the amount of dopamine released to that reward predictive cue. Uh, you see the same thing occur if you would infuse the Ramanavant directly into the ventral tegmental area where the dopamine neurons that I'm studying are, suggesting that I mean, this could actually be a localized effect on the dopamine system rather than, you know, as we've said, CB1 receptors are the most widely expressed G protein receptor in the brain. You know, they're having lots of effects, but the effects of dopamine uh, seem to be very important in decreasing reward directed behavior. However, how did the story of Accomplia end? Not good. Exactly. People didn't want to eat, but they also did not want to live. Correct. So, uh, yeah, that, that idea is out. Uh, but, you know, I do think, you know, having been to a few, like, cannabinoid meetings, it does, there are still some uh, devoted followers here. Uh, with, I guess, two things that I think are worth noting. One is that the... Uh, SR-14, 17, 16 may not actually be a pure antagonist at the CB1 receptor. Uh, this has been argued by Elliot Gardner at NIDA that uh, you know, this drug could actually be doing other things in addition to acting as an inverse agonist at the CB1 receptor. So it could actually be uh, you know, producing effects on its own rather than just blocking endocannabinoid signaling. So a drug like AM251, it's thought to have more specific effects on uh, as just a competitive CB1 receptor antagonist, could still have therapeutic utility without creating suicidal ideations, mm -hmm. although that's going to be difficult to test at this point, I would say. Uh, and there are also, I guess, others that still argue that, uh, you know, it's difficult to know, of course, you know, whether or not these patients would have committed suicide without a monomon on board, which is also, you know, a French study in 2014 showed that pregnenolone also blocks the CD1 receptor. Did, you didn't see that? I did not see that. I'll, I'll send it to you because I don't know if there's any correlation between that and the way that the action of the Morgan. I, I, I think, you know, the effects of the CD1 receptor antagonism were striking. I mean, like, you know, and, you know same within the, the clinical trials. I mean, like, it really seemed to reduce craving for really everything. I mean, like, whatever you're doing. Exactly. Well, yeah, but for lots of people life too. But you know, like whether that's uh, you know just a robotic thing, or like you know whether uh, you know a better uh, competitive antagonist that didn't produce a lot of other effects might be uh, a better pharmacotherapeutic uh, 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 candidate. I'll send you the French study on pregnenolone. I'd love to see. It. So, Eric, did it reduce the dopamine? Yes, it reduced the dopamine. Uh, we've only seen it reduce uh, like uh, the actual responses to like drugs and these sorts of things, rather than basal levels. But it's a little difficult to measure basal dopamine levels. Uh, I, I, I did not see a big reduction in basal dopamine levels, which you might think would occur. Uh, but, you know, yet, yeah, those would be evoked by any reward, I would say. Like, you know, those that would be, like these dopamine release events that I've, I've been showing you are really, uh, you know, you would observe that during variety of natural rewards, including, you know, presentation of sugar, uh, presentation of a sexually receptive partner. This has been done. Uh, you know, I, I would argue that uh, Ramanavak would decrease any of those things, including, like, for pleasurable, like, sort of natural things like sex, in addition to the seeking of drugs which, you know, could, you know, contribute to suicidal ideations. Uh, you know, yeah. bit of a bummer. Uh, glad that I work with rats other than people, I guess. Also. <laughs> but uh, now I want to concentrate only on the effects of endocannabinoid manipulations on dopamine release and behavior. Uh, again, I have not found any positive effects of enandamide on dopamine release that I have been able to detect. Again, I, I don't know if this is, like, we just need better enzymatic inhibitors or what deal is. But uh, overall, I think that endocannabinoids offer uh, strong potential as uh, therapeutic candidates. You know, I think it's great that uh, the cannabis experiment is going on now, but I, 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 would, I hope that we don't lose track of uh, the potential that endocannabinoid pharmacology could hold. Uh, you know, first, the effects could be more subtle than just complete uh, agonism or antagonism of the CB1 receptor. 
Also, it is possible that different endocannabinoids are expressed in different brain regions at different levels. Therefore, rather than targeting all CB1 receptors systemically throughout the body and brain, you could potentially target those involved in specific psychiatric disorders by targeting specific endocannabinoids. Uh, here is an animal going through a very similar task to what you just saw, but in this case, the animal was not administered Ramonabon. What I administered here is a drug known as JZL184. Uh, there are two primary enzymes that are thought to break down anandamide and turacodonoglycerol. Uh, there I highlighted the amount of dopamine that was evoked by that reward predictive Q there in red. So now I, I, present, I treated the animal with a monoacylglycerol lipase inhibitor. Uh, MAD lipase is thought to be involved, the primary enzyme that breaks down turacodonoglycerol in the brain. So these animals would show heightened levels of turacodonoglycerol. This is something that we also confirmed at the chemical level. So now with extra uh, turacodonoglycerol on board, you can observe enhanced dopamine release at the Q here that I again hallmarked in red. Also, I, I think this is a fascinating video because it shows very clear increases in dopamine release every time the animal approaches that reward directed, uh, reward associated lever. But now when the Q is actually uh, illuminated, with the 2AG levels heightened, you observe increased dopamine release to that reward predictive Q, which you would think could uh, facilitate reward seeking behavior. You know, do the opposite of Ramadabot might be useful in treating things like anhedonia. So, you know, again with JZL184, a monosuglycerol lipase inhibitor, we observe the animals respond faster for a reward, and we observe increased dopamine concentration at that reward predictive cue. Uh, this was a fascinating study, uh, you know, that's been very uh, much replicated and hyped by a, a number of groups showing that uh, the endocannabinoid system is also uh, crucial for the uh, formation and retention of traumatic memories. Uh, this, what you can see here, is are the results from a study uh, published in Nature by the lab of Giovanni Marsicano, where they, uh, you know, they did a series of studies here to address the role of the endocannabinoid system. Again, they're using uh, Ramadabon, in this case, to sort of block the effects of endocannabinoids from binding to the CB1 receptor. What they do here is you present the animal uh, on one day with an uh, inescapable, very potent electric foot shock that is then uh, culminates with the presentation of a tone. You can then bring back the animal the next day and play back the tone. When you do this, the animal shows a conditioned freezing response, which is thought to uh, be somewhat of a model of uh, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, so what the uh, authors found and first reported is that uh, you know, the next day when you come back in and play this tone alone, in regular animals that weren't treated with Ramadabond, you see this sort of fear extinction memory uh, decay very rapidly. They, they begin uh, to uh, no longer respond to that uh, fear-associated tone. Uh, and you know, don't really show any freezing behavior on day two. Whereas those that you interrupted the endocannabinoid signaling, uh, the uh, fear memory persisted, suggesting that maybe the opposite can occur, which has been uh, demonstrated with both 2-AG and uh, anandamide, actually. Um, uh, her, her last name is Guzman, if you, uh, I'm trying to remember her full name, but anyway. There is a, uh, a, a, a series of studies, and they've even demonstrated that even increasing uh, anandamide alone in the uh, amygdala is sufficient to uh, sort of facilitate the extinction of the fear memory. And you know, this is a question that I, I stole directly from Rafael Mishulam. Uh, but you know, why would our brain have molecules that make us forget? His answer to this was pretty simple. Do you really want to uh, remember everybody's face on the train ride home? But you know, it, it's very important that you know our, we are geared at, like we have neural mechanisms that help us forget uh, you know a variety of experiences. Forgetting might even be more important than remembering if you think about it. Because no woman would ever have a second child. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so you know, we we wanted. 
like, you know, I actually don't have endocannabinoid dopamine manipulations here yet, but, you know, we provided, or I provided the first demonstration of what actually dopamine does in real time during this condition freezing task. So I thought I would show that because I do think it is quite relevant here. So, you know, on day one again, we uh, provide foot shock that culminates uh, with this tone, and that tone is then associated with this sort of conditioned fear shot. Uh, I, I'm thinking gunshot in my head, but yeah, it, like sort of mimics like a car backfiring, and then you associate that with like a gunshot. So uh, then we play back the tone alone on day two, the freezing response dissipates. If you look at what dopamine does on trials in which the animal freezes, you can observe a suppression in dopamine release. I would argue that a drug like JZL184, or you know, maybe even cannabis itself, that is going to increase dopamine release could uh, possibly help alleviate some of these fear memories. Uh, you know, we have shown, uh, and these are studies currently under review, that optogenetically, this would be, a, is anybody familiar with the concept of optogenetics? This is a, a, a technique where we can actually assess the causal effects of increasing dopamine release transiently using a laser. Essentially, we, I, I shoot a laser into the animal's brain, activate a light-sensitive ion channel that I introduce into the dopamine neurons using a virus, and this allows me to turn on and off the dopamine neurons like a light switch. So what we find is that if we facilitate dopamine release using the laser, the animal's fear memory extinguishes at a faster rate. Again, I think this would be facilitated by increasing tuorecanone glycerol. This study with the dopamine recordings is yet to be done. This is also a, a, a grant that I am currently working on that is uh, going to have an endocannabinoid component. Uh, here, what we are doing is assessing whether or not uh, various upstream modulators of dopamine release could be effective agonist therapies for heroin dependence. What I'm doing here is I, I uh, take animals and uh, that have acquired heroin self-administration. So here they would have a IV uh, line that I place into their jugular, uh, and then they can take direct shots by pressing a lever of heroin directly into the vasculature. I then give them access to heroin for a full month. They self-administer uh, 23 hours a day. We just come in one hour a day for health checks and to record all the data. They become incredibly dependent uh, on uh, heroin in this process. And this is, the rat is in isolation, not in a rat city or a rat park? Correct. The animals are in isolation. Uh, you know, when they're actually self-administering, uh, they, they uh, can chew through each other's uh, tethers. Uh, Rat Park was sort of a funky study that I'm honestly not a huge fan of. Uh, one of the people that I think is doing some good work with social interaction with drug self-administration is a guy by the name of Mark Smith. So the way he does it is, you know, I actually helped him set it up, but he, he sort of just mates two chambers with a, you know, the animals can come into contact snap to snap, but they can't actually get to each other's uh, catheter lines and chew them out, which they do do if they can come in contact. So anyway, then I uh, precipitate withdrawal using naloxone. Uh, and by the way, does anybody, what are your opinions on cannabis withdrawal, out of curiosity? Because I've also done these studies with cannabis withdrawal that I don't have here. Well, ask somebody who dabs a gram a day and then take it away cold turkey. Yes, very good. Yeah, I, I, I think that like, that would be very similar to some, a study that I've done with wind, you know, which I would say was probably very similar to dabbing. Uh, you know, and then uh, if you challenge the animal with your monobond, the animal goes into profound withdrawal. It's not as severe as opiate withdrawal, but you see similar behaviors that are very abnormal in a rat, well, including like uh, hand twitching. What we're finding is it's dose dependent, and that's what Dr. Burke's saying oh. here, is that dabs are an extremely high, super potent, concentrated form of cannabis that gives you a huge dose all at one point right. in time. Right. And it seems to oversaturate cannabinoid receptors. Studies have been done in rats on, on oversaturated receptors, and it seems to be some leakage in cannabis 
cannabinoid receptor oversaturation into opioid receptors. So I think that's why we see worse uh, withdrawal it, symptoms. So is that conjecture or is that proof? That is from a study that I read, but it was in rats. And remember, only 20% translates into people. So yeah, we yeah. don't know if it's actually doing the same thing in people or not. So it is absolute conjecture at this point in time. It's a study I read that talks about it, but once again, I, I I'm highly, not sure. <laughs> I, I, I highly recommend you look up some of the recent work by Aaron Lichtman's group from VCU. They've shown some, like, quite a bit of interaction between the cannabinoid and opioid systems that could be important for drug withdrawal. Now, that said, at a lecture that I was giving in Summit County a couple of years ago to a hospital group, I had a couple of anesthesiologists stand up and say that when we are putting people under who, who use dabs, uh, consistently a report that they're dabbing five, ten times a day like that, that they they were asking me what to do, and I'm like, well, stick a cannabis patch on them, because they said they were seeing signs of withdrawal that to them mimicked opioid withdrawal. And I'm like, I've only read this one study on receptor saturation. It seems to be there's some overlap, but the patch seemed to help, because this is what anesthesiologists <coughs> saw. We have, have some controversy in this room that you may not be aware of. My practice actively will counsel against dabbing on a regular basis. Me well, too. Yep. <laughs> I don't think it's necessarily, I, I think you reach a point of diminishing returns. <laughs> yeah. Right, but, but if you look at the reality of the situation, probably 50% of the dispensaries stay in business because of selling concentrates and that, so the idea is though, medically it may be only indicated less than 5%. But as far as recreational go, and the demographic between 18 or 21 and 30, that's where the money is being made by the dispensary, and that's the underbelly of this the whole industry. Yes, yeah, selling yeah. Of, yeah. selling of potent potent stuff that's being dabbed and also utilized. Same thing in vape pens and the concentrated of oils yeah. as well, where you get 60, 70, 80, 90 percent THC. Yeah. yeah. That's so, where you're well, in that's where it's I got a yes, we see, yes, yes, we see withdrawal, but it seems to be dose dependent and greater with the the high dose. That essence. makes perfect sense to me. I was going to throw a monkey wrench in to this because I think you know when we're talking uh, we can we um, we confuse potency and purity. A lot of times when we're talking about concentrates, I have to disagree with some of the doctors here because there are cases where concentrates, where dabbing can be medicinal. I will agree that it's not great for people to be doing all day, all the time. I agree with that. But the vape pens with the concentrates are, are very useful for patients, especially when you're out. So to, to insinuate that those are not medicinal, I think is a mistake. I don't think we insinuated that. Are. We didn't insinuate that. Sorry, in fact, let me finish. In fact, in a lot of ways, I mean, you guys all tell people they should be vaporizing. That's the a great way to do it. And for people that have issues with a lot of the um, allergic reactions or that are concerned with the plant material, you take that out of the picture with the concentrate. So. You know, assuming that the, the high number of, of amount of concentrates that's being sold is because everybody's dabbing it out, I think it's a mistake. Can that's all I'm saying. Uh, Terry, in fairness, the first thing I think I said was dose dependent, yes. a gram a day. Mm -hmm. You were let's the only one in the conversation. Let's keep this in context. And yeah, we don't tell people not to dab. Well, um, I will explicitly really, you do? say uh, dabbing daily is on a regular basis. I think, and and clinically, I can I I will absolutely stand by it. But I can tell you as a as a chronic pain patient that dabbing can be very effective for regular pain. It can also a vape pen, and which is, is what Dr. Bregman mentioned. A, de a vape pen with a concentrate in it to be able to dose discreetly during the day as you need to because you can get CBD concentrates as well can be also very effective. Well, we're not talking about CBD, we're talking THC, we're talking about receptor 
uh, tolerance, section. right? Yes. We're building tolerance. And so this, we can't back off of it. I agree that you get, and I tell people the same thing with smoking, that you get that roller coaster effect. I'm so, just saying that there are cases, medical cases, where that can be very effective. That's good. No, I, I, think I don't disagree. Yeah, I, think I have no disagreement with you. I that you would see a lot of things that is, is using this recreationally and doesn't really have that medicinal need. So much, I think when you have that need, you can process it differently. And, and I would, see more of I a would make an exception for a patient with cancer versus a 20 year old who is in. I, this is beyond the scale of the lecture. Well, yeah, the Sorry. compulsive use in the absence of symptoms. I appreciate you to follow the use <laughs> The debate is. Okay. Let's see, let's go on. Let's talk about that. We can talk about this all day. I, 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 I love the uh, discussion. I mean, like, you know, it, it's, uh, it, I think there are lots of controversies surrounding you know, this, and it's great to, uh, you know, hear such a thoughtful debate. Uh, but, yeah, here, essentially what we have is really physically dependent uh, heroin-addicted animals. And we are then assessing the effects of uh, conditioned drug withdrawal. Uh, uh, an effect that's been really well studied uh, or characterized by Anna Rose Childress and Chuck O'Brien, uh, two uh, leading addiction psychiatrists at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, they, they would uh, give you many stories and have published many stories about their patients, uh, you know, leaving completely, uh, no longer physically dependent on the heroin itself, going back to the same sort of slum that they were uh, from. Uh, being exposed to the same sorts of uh, cues and stimuli that were associated with the drug itself, and they actually can measure physiological measures, including changes in body temperature, uh, you know, skin conductance, uh, that mimics withdrawal, uh, even in the absence of the drug itself. So that is what we're uh, first trying to characterize here, and what we find is that uh, when the animals are responding for a sugar reward, we can still see this increase in dopamine release that we observed before, but when it's paired with this withdrawal-associated tone, we observe a suppression in dopamine release and a suppression in reward-directed behavior. Whether or not this would be overcome by raising levels of 2-arachidonyl glycerol is the next research question. I don't have an answer there yet. My prediction is that it would, and would be, uh, could be an effective agonist therapy you know, I, I'm actually, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask no matter what. What, what are you guys' opinions on the idea of cannabis as an agonist therapy for heroin and other drugs of abuse? Oh, Horrible okay. idea? Trading one drug for another drug? As an exit drug. As an exit drug, yeah. Like, as opposed to uh, uh, buprenorphine. Yeah, yeah suboxone. Yeah. Good? Yeah? I went to a seminar and they were talking about where the states we have um, marijuana. They believe that there's a 25% reduction in opioid deaths when the person does opioid suppress respiration and heart rate, whereas you know, we don't have receptors for that at the base of our brain. So the deaths actually go down if you have marijuana available. And there are actually studies that show that marijuana helps with the withdrawal symptoms from removing narcotics, and I can send those to you. Dustin Sulak has a bunch of those. Absolutely. First one. Yeah, okay. So, First okay. one. <laughs> that I know of. Yeah. So we're all about it as a, as a you know, a harm reduction. I, I, I think it's a fascinating idea that, uh, yeah, I, I am being recorded. I don't think Knight is a big fan. <laughs> but yes. Uh, right. That's all I'll say on that. <laughs> but yeah, it, uh, you know, it doesn't seem to be too popular at the federal level, but it is a good thing that uh, you guys are thinking about it. Uh, you know, this last part is really pretty basic and sort of gets at, uh, it's somewhat of a replication of what I've already shown. So I think I'm just going to skip past this and give you my summary and open this up to a great uh, discussion. So, you know, I think to me, the literature is incredibly clear that exogenous cannabinoids, including phytocannabinoids and synthetic cannabinoids, increase dopamine release, which likely contributes to the abuse potential of cannabis. Repeated use of synthetic cannabinoids produces profound tolerance to dopamine-releasing effects of cannabinoids. 
Endocannabinoids are upstream neuromodulators of dopamine release. And I think both exogenous and endogenous cannabinoids could be used to treat a variety of symptoms invo involving aberrant dopamine signaling. With that, I'd like to thank my current research team, my funding sources, and you for your attention. So would it be simple-minded to think of the reason for the 25% decrease, which is why I came to the talk tonight? I'm trying to figure it out. Like, is, are you saying that chronic cannabis users diminish their dopamine signaling? And would that be the reason then why, if you're smoking cannabis or using cannabis while you're trying to get off heroin, you can successfully? Uh, I don't know about the latter part. Uh, but I, I do think that, uh, in my opinion, and I think that a lot more work needs to be done, that uh, cannabis can lead to uh, desensitization of uh, CB1 receptors. In fact, that's been pretty clearly documented. Yeah. Um, really throughout the brain. It, uh, you know, and that would lead to reduced release of dopamine uh, following, uh, you know, the binding of cannabinoids to the receptor. I don't think that that is the reason that it is uh, effective as a treatment for opiate dependence, though. I, I think that that actually could be, you know, I hate to say the word gateway, but yeah, it, it could actually be, uh, you know, that that I think is bad. Uh, unless you have a uh, heightened uh, dopaminergic responsivity and you need uh, that reduced or blunted. But, uh, no, in my opinion, uh, like that, first, that I think would occur uh, more uh, to a greater effect uh, with a dabbing or uh, synthetic cannabinoids like spice gold, uh, probably to a lesser extent with other uh, products. And in my opinion, the, the reason that it is effective at uh, reducing uh, heroin dependence is that, uh, in my opinion, uh, the maintenance of sort of a steady state dopamine level is very much involved there. So uh, a heroin user would be experiencing big peaks and then big drops in dopamine release. It's during that big trough that, uh, you know, you might go uh, hop for more. And uh, the idea of agonist therapy, like whether it's buprenorphine or can cannabis, I think it's just a way of having sort of a prolonged level of dopamine release rather than this up, rapid up-down. Uh, same sort of idea with methadone. I just think that cannabis might be safer. Yes? So in regards to mental illness, okay, so what conclusions can we draw with regards to what your research is and the practicality of looking at depression and looking at bipolar and looking at things like that. Let's say we leave schizophrenia out of the mix at this point in time. Fair enough. As let's go to bipolar and, and depression. Fair enough. You know, bipolar, of course, varies a lot. You guys know more about this than I do, but I, I would, uh, I, I guess I would, exp what is it, type two bipolar disorder, the one that would have been involved more in depressive symptoms? Yes. I, I would, I, I guess, I, as a non-physician, I would predict to see uh, beneficial effects of cannabis in bipolar type 2 and depressed patients. And that, uh, you know, really, I mean, again, this is my opinion, but, you know, I think a lot of people through the 70s and, uh, you know, really through the 60s and 70s, a lot of people were using amphetamines pretty com like much more commonly than they are today. I think that, uh, you know, enhanced dopamine release. I think was uh, being effectively used as an antidepressant, uh, you know, for a couple of decades there. Uh, I, I think that amphetamine itself can produce antidepressant properties, but I think cannabis is a safer way to go. And I do think that you know, through part of that mechanism would be an increase in dopamine release. I also am a believer that there are different uh, uh, neurobiological bases, or the, the etiology of uh, depression remains incredibly controversial. Uh, you know, there could be uh, some patients that are very res uh, responsive to an SSRI versus those that would be more receptive uh, to, uh, well, buprenorphine. Uh, uh, buprenor no, bupropion. Yes. Bupropion? Yes. Yes. 
Yeah, so, right, I, I would be willing to predict that in a patient who was very receptive to bupropion, they would also be very receptive to cannabis. This I have no evidence on. I'm not a, cl I'm not a clinician. Don't listen to me. But that's my opinion. But increased dopamine levels are associated with episodes of mania. Correct. Which I, why I wouldn't give it to the, uh, the other bipolar. Yes. Uh, yeah, in bipolar people. So why right. you don't give them a lot of tyrosine and want them to stay away from energy drinks. Absolutely. That's what, like I, I was only thinking about those who would uh, display like primarily like down depressed symptoms, which I would uh, be, think would be more associated with a, a hypodopaminergic state. Yes. Um, so, how exactly are you measuring and monitoring the dopamine levels? I mean, it's very complex because in a human, yeah. it's, for accuracy, it needs to be the lumbar puncture. Are you doing a lumbar puncture on these rats? No. Yeah. <laughs> we're doing something much more precise. I mean, like we're. Uh, I I, bored, I spared you with the boring details, but I'm glad that you asked. I'm using a technique called fast scan cyclic voltammetry. This is an electrochemical technique that uh, uh, every 100 milliseconds, I'm actually taking a sample of uh, dopamine, or I'm looking for dopamine in a region of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. What I'm really doing is measuring a redox reaction. Uh, like I am applying a small potential, and that is changing dopamine if it's present really quickly to dopamine and oxide, and then back to dopamine. That change in current, I'm taking directly, then I calibrate my electrode to see tested sensitivity, come up with a calibration factor, and convert that actual current into nanomole dopamine. And that is how we can measure dopamine in a particular brain region uh, with incredibly high temporal and spatial resolution. Our uh, temporal resolution is 100 milliseconds. Uh, you know, the width of the probe is about 10 microns. Like, uh, and this technique has actually been done in people a few times. Uh, uh, you know, it's only been done a few times because it's invasive. But, uh, you know, it's been done at the Mayo Clinic at Baylor University and is currently being pursued at Wake Forest University and uh, Virginia Tech. But, uh, you know, in those studies, you don't get as much information because they're typically being, uh, uh, the probes are being lowered along with the probe, uh, you know, equipment for deep brain stimulation and almost all the patients you know, have underlying neurological disorders, but it has been used to try to understand the role of dopamine and adenosine and like, deep brain stimulation and these sorts of things. So you know, the, these probes provide, produce very little brain damage, which is another huge benefit. Uh, you know, they, they are very thin and are probably producing a lot less damage than the actual probes for the deep brain stimulation in people. Thank you. Any other questions? You want me to, I'll ask my question real quick and it'd be a good thing to end. Let's, um, let's uh, dream just for a second. Let's say that you could get good, clean Colorado cannabis and you could design a study um, for good and it, you could really study it down deep um, in a way. What would you do as a study to um, benefit and find the benefits of this? Um, what, would you, what kind of thing would you do? If we had like a, a research place where you could go in and do real research here in Colorado, what would you do? Man, I have a long list. <laughs> I, really, I really have a long list. Um, uh, I, I guess I'm going to give my uh, two of my dream experiments are to uh, pull in, bring in different strains with different effects of uh, different makeups of cannabinoids, and actually measure dopamine release in real time as I'm providing, uh, you know, uh, uh, vapor from the distinct strains of cannabis and see what different effects the different makeups actually have on dopamine release. The other thing I would love to do is that uh, the cannabis drug self-administration literature, like I said, is a mess. I mean, like it's still pretty yeah. current dogma that animals don't self-administer cannabis. I think that's just because the experiments haven't been done well. Most of these are using pure, straight, Delta 98C. What I would like is a little, I would love uh, to be allowed to find a company here that would make me little, you know, uh, small amounts of uh, uh, various cannabinoids. You want uh, Julie's seeds, I, they're sunflower seeds coated with canna butter. That oh, there you go. This is what I want, and I, I want different makeups to see how the animals would actually, like, take these drugs if they involve, you know, the full entourage that you experience with different strains. I think that's how you can get it done. I think it would work, it's just we can't do it. Okay. So. Okay.
Well, Dr. Chris Benton it may be. <laughs> there we go. No. Let's thank Dr. Olson again for speaking. Uh, That's our meeting for tonight, July 18th. It's Dr. Andrew Monti. Uh, we will see you then. If anyone has anything specific they want to eat, let me know and I will. <laughs> uh, yeah,